be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Man, it is a great day to be able to worship alongside of you. I'm so excited that you have decided to worship with us here at Highland. If you are a guest with us today, I want to just issue a special welcome to you. Um, again, we, we, are, we, we, we do not take for granted the fact that you could have chosen to be anywhere this morning, but you have chosen to be with us here at Highland. To be, you've chosen to worship the risen Savior of the universe alongside of us, and that is truly something that that we are excited about. If you are a guest, especially if this is your first time or if you've never done it before, there are two ways that, that I encourage you to, uh, two things I encourage you to do this morning. One of them is um, probably the only time anyone's ever going to stand up behind this pulpit and encourage you to text during church. Uh, there is a number on the screen behind me. I encourage you to, to use your cell phone to text that number. Just text the letters HBC, uh, in case you didn't know. HBC stands for Highland Baptist Church. Just make sure we're all on the same page there. Um, but what will happen is you'll be sent a link, and you will, uh, if you'll just take a couple of minutes to fill that out, it'll let us get a little more information about you, uh, let you get a little more information about us. And um, the, uh, if, if texting's not really your, your jam, there is something in your, in your uh, worship guide that you can fill out. Tear it out, fill it out, and drop it off in the offering plate a little bit later in the service. Um, Again, it just lets us get a little more information about you so that we can keep you better informed about, about some of the ministries that we are offering here at Highland. Um, again, just, just w welcome, excited that you're here. Uh, you may have noticed something out of the ordinary already this morning, and that is that, that that's not Abby. <laughs> um, Abby is away this week, and so she has um, lined up Dusty Culpepper to come and lead us in worship, or, or lead us to the cross as we worship together this morning. Um, I asked Dusty beforehand how he wanted me to introduce him. He said, just say my name, people know me. So here we go. That's Dusty. Um, that, did I get it right? Okay, cool. Um, but anyway, it's just super excited that you're here. There's one special thing that I want to make mention of this morning. If you've been here the last couple of weeks, and you know that today is, um, is, is a, a, a bittersweet day in the life of Highland. It's our children's minister, uh, Dana Casey. Today's her last Sunday. Um, bitter because we hate to see her step away from a place in ministry that she's done so many awesome things as sweet as it's hard to be sad whenever somebody is following Christ and being obedient to his calling. And we, we trust that that's what's happening in her life. And so I encourage you as you see her today, just love on her. I mean, the, the, the greatest thing is that she's not leaving us. She's still going to be a member here, but she has just uh, been emphatic in that, that she's going to continue to serve and follow, but just as a member, not as a staff. And so we're excited to continue to serve alongside of her just in a little bit different capacity. But with that being said, with this being her last day, um, there will be an opportunity for you to just kind of in another way share your love with her as we will be taking up a special love offer for her this morning. So when that opportunity comes, um, I encourage you to just give generously, give as God leads you, um, just because it's a way of, again, just thanking her for her years of service here at Highland and just continue to love on her as she continues to pursue Christ. Um, but I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Um, yeah, so if you'd allow me to, I would love to pray over us as we continue our time of worship today. Lord God, we love you, and we thank you, Lord, for who you are. We thank you for, um, Lord, just for how good you are. Lord, whenever the world begins to crumble around us, whenever we begin to get tossed and turned through the waves, Lord, we know that you are in control. We know that you are good. We know that your love endures forever. Lord, I pray this morning that anyone who steps behind this, this podium, me or, or Dusty or Brother David or anyone else, Lord, I pray that you do not see or hear us, but Lord, that you are worshiped through us. Lord, I pray that the congregation, the people in the building, people watching online, people watching through the app, Lord, I pray that, Lord, that worship happens. I pray that you are genuinely and sincerely lifted high and glorified this morning. Lord, we love you because you first loved us. We praise you because you are the only one worthy of our praise and adoration. And it is your, in your sweet name that we pray. Amen. And again this morning. Um, that wasn't exactly what I told Clint to how he to introduce me. 
<laughs> but, but it's all in, all in great fun. It is so good to be in Highland Baptist Church this morning. I am, uh, again, I am Dusty Culpepper, and I have such, such fine, fine memories of being in this place. Uh, I see people that I've worked with. I've seen people that I've officiated ball games with. And, and I tell you this, I was so glad when you guys called David Hopkins to be your pastor. That is a fine, fine man right there. He, uh, I've known David for a long, long time. We were in school together and uh, just a great man of God. And so you got it right. You got it right. So let's sing this morning. Um, let's sing and crown him kings of, king of kings. Just sing with us. And I'll tell you this, it's more important to hear your voices than it is mine today, okay? So lift your voices up to the Lord this morning. Crown him king. Crown him king. Let's pray. 
God, if we just stop and reflect that what you did for us at Calvary, you crucified yourself, your body, and took all our sin upon you, Lord, so that we can live with you forever. Praise Jesus. Thank you, Lord. God, I just think that even sometimes just our, just our words cannot be enough to thank you for that. So God, I pray, Lord, that as people, Lord, that we'll be obedient to your leading in our life, Lord, that we'll let our lives live a life worthy of the praise, Lord, of what you've done for us at Calvary. So thank you, Lord. God, we also get to thank you, God, by giving tithes and offerings, and we've come to that time now where I just pray, Lord, you just bless, Lord, just the, the gifts that are going to be given. Bless the giver. And God, we pray, Lord, that these things that are going to be given, Lord, will be just used just to show Jesus to this community, to this state, and even around the world. So thank you for letting us be able to give. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, again, I want to say how much I appreciate you guys making me feel so welcome today. Um, I, uh, I've kid to people before that where I live, we, we kind of have a little Highland annex out there because I've got Roberts on one side of me and I've got Columns on the other. So I've been surrounded. <laughs> but um, again, it's, uh, it's so good to be here this morning. Um, the Bible says in Psalms, it talks about the goodness of God and, and how it flows through uh, all the generations, and, and this morning I've got my daughter, uh, Mary Ashley, my little girl. I know she's 16, but I still call her my little girl. And uh, so we're going to sing a song about the goodness, of, uh, the goodness of God. So if you would, just sing with us this morning if you know it, and uh, we hope you enjoy it. Never fails me 
in all my days I've been held in your head From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God In all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that i am able oh i will sing of the goodness of god i love your voice you have led me through the fire in darkest night you were close like no other i've known you as a father i've known you as a friend and i have lived in the goodness of god in all my life you have been faithful in all my so so good with every breath that i am able oh i will sing of the goodness of god Whoa. In all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God God has been good to you guys, amen? Amen. Such a joy to share this time with Dusty and uh, his family, Tori and Mary Ashley. Um, thank you guys for uh, just loving us by loving Jesus. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so just to kind of, uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Jonah 3 before we just jump into there. Um, want to uh, just remind you about uh, what's coming up next week. Um, who knows what next week is? Casual Sunday. Casual Sunday. Good. All right. Yeah, Casual Sunday. Um, and we uh, will have no Sunday school that day, but we will meet uh, in the FLC, the Family Life Center, at 10 o'clock. There will be a light breakfast uh, provided before then. Um, but here's the deal, is that we do have a goal of how many people we want to see in there. Um, the goal is 400, and that seems uh, very doable for what God has been doing in our midst lately. Um, but we're actually, we told Alan, um, our, our uh, head maintenance guy, that, uh, look, we, we want 500 chairs. Uh, we want that many. And this is what the deal is, though. We want as many people in there to hear about Jesus. That's what this is about. We want people to see what God is doing in and through Highland and to meet this Lord of ours who completely changes our life and has this great purpose for Highland, great purpose for us um, in this community. So 
I want to invite you to help us out on that. Make plans to be here next week. Um, we're going to do a community survey afterwards. By m- no means do you, being here on the, uh, at 10 o'clock going through the worship service, you're signing up for the community survey project. That's, not, that's a different thing. That's separate. We want your help. We need your help. We want to have 12 groups go send, uh, send out through our community, knock on doors, uh, door to door, meet our neighbors here. But if you can't do that, no worries. There's another option for you. If you love to pray, we're going to have a prayer group here. As we're going out, we want to invite you to uh, come here as well and pray. Um, And so, uh, but if you can't, you got to run, you got to run, you got to, you know, whatever it is, that's fine. We just want you to invite your neighbors, invite your friends, invite your uh, family, all of those people that uh, you want them to know who Jesus is. I'm making a promise you. I promise you, I will preach Jesus. I always do. Um, that's my aim every week is to hold high the gospel, the good news of Jesus. So if you want people to hear about Jesus, bring them next week. And so I'm looking forward to that. Now, I am so, so glad to be with you guys this week and to be back with you. I was in revival last week at Mantee Baptist Church. Anybody know where Mantee is? Yeah, it's, uh, somebody asked me a while ago, it's, it's in the middle of nowhere. I said, no, it's on the other side of the middle of nowhere. Um, <laughs> I had to go through that to get there. Um, I'd never been there, loved this church, loved what God's doing in this church and through this church. And the first day, um, last Sunday, uh, we were sitting there as a family and we were worshiping and and, and it's a very traditional uh, uh, church. And so I had my hymnal out, or I was about to get my hymnal, and I asked my, my daughter um, that was laying up against me, I said, hey, hand me that hymnal there. And she kind of had this really dumbfounded look on her face like, huh? I said, hand me the green book in front of you. Oh, why didn't you just say that? <laughs> so, look, I know that the subject we're going to talk about today is as foreign a concept sometimes as a hymnal is in many of our uh, children now. We're going to talk about a very difficult subject this morning when it comes to Jonah 3. But before we get there, um, I want to set this up with this thought. So have you ever seen the movie WALL-E? The little Disney Pixar movie. I know that uh, some people haven't seen that, but you don't have to see the movie to get this point. But the the plot of the movie is Wally is a trash collecting robot, and, and all the, uh, the 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 humans have absolutely trashed the Earth to the point to where they can't live there. Nothing can survive on Earth. And so they've all gathered in this spaceship, and they're, they've been orbiting Earth for like 300 years. It's some long time like that. Well, they forgot Wally. Wally is still on the Earth. He's this little cute little robot, and he goes around picking up trash and doing things like that. One day, this little guy finds a plant. Now, this plant is when things are not being able to survive on the earth, this is key for everything. The hope, the you know, survival of the human race. And do you remember what he potted the plant in? That's right. So he found this old, worn out, dirty, stinky, 300 year old boot with the laces and the toe coming off of it. This boot was absolutely worthless, found in a trash pile somewhere. And yet, he takes this worthless looking boot and he salvages this boot and this boot becomes the protector of this life throughout the rest of the movie. He gives this boot a second chance. Anybody ever feel like a worn out 300 year old stinky, dusty, dirty boot? (laughs) Sure, we've all been there, right? We've all been there. We understand that feeling. Maybe, you know, you've squandered or at least you think you've squandered something that God's given you to do. Maybe you didn't take the opportunity that God brought your way. Maybe you messed up, you made mistakes, and you think there's no way that God even can use me or even wants to use me. Well, can I tell you that the good news in Jesus Christ is that God is the God of second chances. And he loves, absolutely loves to give second chances and third and fourth and 20th chances to those who will turn to him in faith. Clint uh, did an outstanding job last week of preaching the first uh, section of this, of Jonah's second chance. This week, we're going to look at the people of Nineveh's second chance. So this is kind of like the God of second chances, part two, (laughs) second, right? So the Bible is full of people that God has given second chances to. Think about Adam and Eve. 
they got a second chance. They messed up in the garden. The, we still deal with the results and the ramifications of that, but God didn't zap them dead, did he? No, he did push them out of the garden, but it was for their own good, and he protected them. He blessed them with a family. He gave them a second chance. Think about Moses, and you're thinking, well, wait a minute now. Uh, you know, Moses, I mean, you know, God struck, you know, what, he struck the rock, and God didn't let him come into the, uh, the promised land. True, but do you remember that Moses killed somebody? And yet God still used him for his purposes. Or what about David? David committed murder and, or adultery and murder, and yet God still used him as well. Or, or Peter, who, can, who denied Jesus, but yet Jesus offers forgiveness and second chance Peter has there. Or Paul was murdering Christians, imprisoning Christians, and yet God changed his life and gave him a second chance. God loves to give second chances to those who will turn to him in faith. So my goal for this morning is to point you to this God of grace who in Jesus has given us a second chance, who in Jesus has given us all things. And part of that is chances to repent, chances to turn back to him if we will come to him in faith because God loves to give second chances to those who turn to him in faith. Can you get the, what the big idea of this text is? God loves to give second chances to those who will turn to him in faith. If you have your copy of God's word, look at it with me. Starting in verse four, we're gonna go back to verse four and set this up a little bit. It says, Jonah began to go into the city going a day's journey and he called out, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. And when God saw what they did, how, or how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them and he did not do it. Let's pray. God, we come before you and... Lord, we confess and we acknowledge, God, that we need you. We need you not just for salvation, although that is absolutely true. God, we need you even when it comes to understanding this divine word that you have given to us, this living and active word. We need your spirit to open our eyes to the truth of the gospel that we are not as good as we pretend that we are. But Jesus' grace and mercy is far better than we could ever imagine him to be. God, help us to see your son Christ and the mercy that he offers us in this text. God, we lay our lives before you and ask that you would do this supernatural work in our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I have two questions as we walk through our text. Now, we're going to walk through the text pretty briskly because there's uh, lots that we need to do. There's lots in this text. There's lots that I don't get to talk about this morning. But what we are going to talk about, we need to walk through pretty quickly. And you can see it's uh, the title, what we're looking, what we're working with this morning is God's heart for repentant people because God loves uh, to give second chances to those who will turn to him in faith. And so we're going to begin, and we're going to look at two questions. Uh, the first question is that uh, we want to know, what does genuine repentance look like? What is it that genuine repentance looks like? What is it that God wants from us as followers of Jesus and as people that may not yet be followers of Jesus? So let's ask or answer the first question. What does genuine repentance look like? Now, there's seven steps of action here or seven traits of genuine repentance. I am going to go through all seven, but I can't preach an entire sermon on all seven. So you have to put our, our listening ears on and listen quick, okay? So here we go. 
What is trait number one that needs to be evident in our life for genuine repentance to take place? Number one is that we realize that God's judgment is imminent. Realize that God's judgment is imminent. Look at verse four there. And he called out, Jonah called out, he proclaimed, he preached. Here's his message. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So just as you heard last week, just to kind of brush back up on this, in Hebrew, Jonah's sermon is only five words long. Even the, the length of his sermon of five words displays how urgent and how imminent God's destruction is going to come. And, and he, it, you know, Jonah is from street to street, house to house, from public square to public square, he is saying 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Adam Bradley said of Jonah's message, his words were amoebic in form, but Jurassic in size. The key word that Jonah is using here is the word overthrown. And the root word in the Hebrew here has two meanings. So when Jonah says 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown, there's two possibilities in this meaning. The first is to turn over or to destroy. That 40 days, Nineveh is going to be destroyed. The second meaning is to turn around or bring to repentance. So 40 days, Nineveh will repent. One refers to destruction, the other refers to offering life. So how did the Ninevites respond to God's offer and invitation of second chance here? Verse 5. Look with me there. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They believed Jonah's message that God had given him. And so what did they do? They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The people heard Jonah's message. They believed Jonah's message and they did something about it. They turned to the Lord. They repented. That word repented in the Hebrew and in the New Testament has pretty much the same connotation. It is to turn around, do a 180, to change your direction. Here's God going this way. Here we are, according to the Bible, going this way. We stop because we see God's grace. We see his mercy. We want that mercy. We want that grace because he's provided it for us, and we turn in his direction. So that's what they did here. They realized God's judgment was imminent. The question, though, is do we realize that God's judgment is imminent? Because whether you agree with this or not, it's closer than you think. James 4.14 says, What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. I know some of you who are uh, young, you think life is going to go on forever. Those of you who are in the uh, later stages of life, you know that's a lie. <laughs> life is like a vapor. And Hebrews 9.27 says, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment. The fact that our life is just a mist in the history of God's creation God's judgment is coming and it is imminent. That should hit us like a ton of bricks. Life is not as long as you think it is. And God's judgment is coming and every sin will be paid for. Every sin has either been paid for for the believer by Jesus on the cross or we will be paid for by the unrepentant person in eternity. Every sin has to be paid for. God's judgment is coming. And yet, but, but, James 2.12 reminds us, mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Jesus has died in our place. He has paid for our sin. He has bore the wrath of God. By his wounds we have been healed, right? As Isaiah said, Jesus took that penalty for you and for me so that you could take God's forgiveness, so that God could be merciful to you. So if we're gonna be genuinely repentant, genuinely following after God, we have to realize that God's judgment is imminent. The second trait here that we see, exercise humility. Exercise humility. Look with me in verse six. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. So when the king heard the people saying, hey, 
God's judgment is coming, he got off his throne, took off his robe, put on sackcloth, and sat in ashes. This is what we call a bottom-to-top repentance. A lot of times, it starts from the top down. As a preacher or as a, maybe a, a national leader, we have to repent. We have to repent, and that's not bad, but that's not what we see here. It actually begins with the people that realize their need for repentance. He hears about it, and then he goes the next step. Look, look what he does. This is awesome. He humbles himself. He gets off of his throne. He took off his royal robe. He put on the sackcloth. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. And he sat in ashes. What is he doing? He humbled himself and he made himself as one of everybody else. This is the same picture that we get that when the sailors and Jonah are in the boat, the sailors, you remember, are guilty by association. They're all in the same boat. Jonah is running, but God's judgment is coming, and they realize we're in the same boat. We need a supernatural fix to this supernatural storm. This guy is saying the same thing. He gets off his throne, he da- he's down in the ashes, he's just like everybody else because he is coming under the exact same judgment. Doesn't matter what his pedigree looks like or how much money or how connected or how well educated or how many people he knows, he understands that God's judgment is coming to him personally. 1 Peter 5.5 5 says, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. This king traded his robe of pride for a garment of humility. This should make us think of another king, right? Because see, there's this other king who stepped down from his throne He took the form of a servant and he became obedient all the way to death on a cross. But the the difference here is the king that came from heaven to earth, he didn't need a second chance. He didn't need a second chance like this earthly king did, but yet he did it anyway. He stepped out of heaven for you personally because you and I need that chance. You and I need the mercy and the grace of God. You and I need the forgiveness of God. And so Jesus took off his robe, stepped out of heaven, and identified with us in the mess and the muck and a life full of sin that we have to deal with of our own making. But Jesus lived a sinless life for you, and Jesus died on the cross for you, and Jesus is alive today for you so that you can have forgiveness and the mercy of God. So we have to exercise humility. The third truth or trait that we see here is that we need to fast from the things that feed our sinful appetite. Fast from the things that feed our sinful appetite. Verse 7, he goes on, he's issuing a proclamation. It says, and he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. So fasting, we're just not very good at fasting. Um, in fact, uh, we're, we're, we're not, you know, we don't like to fast. Um, maybe it's Americans, I don't know what it is, but you know, we, we, the only fast we like is what? Fast food, right? Um, that's the only fasting we like. Um, we just don't fast very well. But Jesus, when he's teaching on fasting, is when you fast, do it this way. So Jesus' understanding is that this is a, a habit, a, a, a spiritual practice that we do just as a natural result of being in a relationship with him. Well, this is, and normally it's in, in relation to prayer, but here it's in regards to a repentant attitude. Why are they fasting? Well, they went without food and water because they, were, they wanted to show God and tell God how serious they were in wanting and desiring his mercy. True repentance will always lead you to quit feeding the appetite that you have for the things of the world. So what are those things that are feeding your sinful appetite? They don't have to be some uh, crazy addiction or anything like that. It could be something as simple as maybe just your addiction to a cell phone. Is your cell phone keeping you? Is it feeding your appetite what about maybe it's a video game or a sport that you really love you really love to watch you really love to go to is that feeding your sinful appetite maybe it's a hobby 
or something as simple as just feeding ourselves of just laziness? What is it that God is wanting to, us to remove so that we can have a true repentant attitude when it comes to who he is and what he's done? So we have to fast from those things that feed our spiritual appetite. The fourth one, mourn your sin. This keeps getting better and better, right? <laughs> mourn your sin. Verse 8, first part, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. So sackcloth was a garment that people would use, they would wear, it was made of, of rough animal hair, usually from a goat, and they wore it to, to show them as a sign of mourning. And, and these people are mourning their sin. They understand that we have sin, we have been violent, and we want God's mercy. And so not just you know, saying that, they went the next step in biblical times to actually clothe themselves with that kind of humility. Now we don't have to wear sackcloth, and Jesus understands that, because this is what Jesus means in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, 4. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, blessed, happy, blessed are you, are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. It is absolutely biblical and true that God is the God of all comfort, but Jesus is not talking about the death of a loved one here. He is not talking about dealing with the difficulties of life and mourning those things. What he means is that you will be comforted when you mourn and you lament over your sin. You will be comforted when you realize that we have sin and that we need a savior. If you never realize that you have sin, then you will never have the comfort of a savior. And Jesus is saying, it's not about the garment that you're wearing, it's about the change in your heart. Do you understand, do you realize, God says, that you are apart from me, you have rebelled against me, and that judgment is coming, but God doesn't want that, and Jesus wants to comfort us in the gospel. But you have to mourn, your sin needs to move you to lamenting that sin, not loving it. I mean, think about it. When's the last time that you mourned over your sin? Do you mourn over your sin? Or are we just okay with our sin? I mean, yeah, maybe sin bothers us, but you can still get a good night's sleep. That's not mourning your sin. That's sleeping with sin. Do we mourn our sin? Genuine repentance will contain mourning over sin. The Ninevites mourned over their sin. We're either going to love our sin or hate it. There is no middle ground. And there's only one thing in this life that is worse than sin. Only one thing. It's the person... <laughs> It was in denial of their sin, which makes forgiveness absolutely impossible. When you mourn over your sin, guys, that is a sign, a sure sign, that God's grace is bigger than your sin. <laughs> that God's mercy is so much more magnificent than our shortcomings. We have to mourn over our sin. Mourning over our sin leads us to the, the fifth trait here, is that we have to cry out to God. Cry out to God. It's not on the screen, but listen to this one. Cry out to God and let them call out mightily to God. Salvation is only possible when we cry out to God. Just going through uh, the book of Jonah, look, Jonah was called to cry out or to call out to the Ninevites. The captain of the ship told Jonah to cry out or to call out to his God. The sailors cried out to Yahweh. Jonah called out to God in his distress. Um, uh, the, the, the people of Nineveh believed God and called out for a general fast. The king told the people to call out or to cry out to God mightily. God saves those who want to be saved. But until you see your sin, you have no need of a savior. Even followers of Jesus, even followers of Jesus, we can get tempted into thinking, well, yes, Jesus did die for my sin and all my sins have been paid for. And that is absolutely biblically and true, or biblical and true. But if you never realize what God has saved you from, if you never, or as you're following Jesus, the closer you are following Jesus, the more prevalent 
God's light begins to shine in your life of how far off you really are and how much you are in desperate need of God's grace just in the day-to-day living. See, repentance and confession, it's more like the guardrails on a steep mountain road going around those curves. You've been in mountains like that before, Gatlinburg or anything? I don't like those mountains. I mean, I, I, I'm have a, you know, I, I don't really like heights that much. And, but I'm really glad that these, these guardrails are on the sides of those mountains. If those guardrails are not on the sides of those mountains, there's always a danger of perishing. Well, confession and repentance is much like that. It keeps you heading in the right direction. We are to cry out to God mightily. Number six, turn from a sinful life. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. So when the text says here that we're to turn from his, they're to turn from his evil way, that means to turn from their evil lifestyle. The daily habits they had, the how they grew up, what they knew, what they understood, the way that they lived their life, their current lifestyle had to change. They were to turn from the violence that they had done. And violence for an Assyrian, that was just a way of life for them. That's all that anyone that grew up as a young boy all the way till they died as an old man, that's all they knew was violence. Now, some of you either have grown up in homes that maybe not, the correlation is not the violence aspect, but maybe some of you grew up in homes where you weren't taught the Bible. You weren't taught the things of God. You weren't uh, privy to God's grace and the conversations and and the hymns and and the, the songs that we get to sing about God. And so therefore, you lived your life with that ignorance and you made some big mistakes and maybe you're having to pay for some of those mistakes now or maybe you know people like that. Can I tell you something that is true for these uh, Ninevites as well as it is true for you? Your past may explain your behavior but it does not excuse it. It does not excuse it. And that is true for me and that's true for you. God is holding these Ninevites just to the same account that he's holding everybody else because God sets the standard and the standard is perfection. And without Christ living that perfect life for us, we have absolutely no hope. None of us can earn that kind of perfection because we fail at every single spot that we have an opportunity without God's grace. Part of repentance here is that you have to own your sin that we don't make excuses, we take responsibility for it, we own it, but then we leave the life behind, the old life behind, and we take on the new life in Christ. We begin new life practices like confession and repentance, like reading the Bible, like worshiping the Lord here as corporate people, but also individually and with our families. It's that we begin to serve others instead of having others want to serve or wanting others to serve us. It's that we want to do what God wants us to do. We share Jesus with others. We take on the new life of Christ. This is one of the biggest display pictures of New Testament baptism. We are discarding our old life and we are putting on Christ. That's what baptism portrays. It pictures that. So we have to turn from a sinful life. Lastly, uh, in, in this part is hope in God's salvation. To have true, genuine repentance, there's this hope in God's salvation that we see here. In verse 9, the, uh, the king almost sort of just throws up his hands and he says, who knows? If we, if maybe if we, if we turn from our sinful life, maybe if we exercise this humility, maybe if we cry out to God, maybe if we quit doing the things that we once did and we do what God wants, maybe, who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Who knows? Well, It's interesting that this is an expression of humility, is that the people of Nineveh and their king, they are throwing themselves onto the mercy of God and the compassion of God. Who knows? Well, can I tell you that we have God's written revelation of what he desires? We don't have to ask that question, who knows? We do know. Jesus took that punishment for us. Jesus died that death for us. We know that we can have mercy. We know that we can have grace. We know that we can have forgiveness because of what Jesus 
has done in our place. We know. Brennan Manning, the uh, author of the Ragamuffin Gospel, he once said that the temptation of the age is to look good without being good, keeping up those appearances, even as church folk, right? We're guilty of that. But the Apostle Paul, kind of combating that in a way, in 2 Corinthians 7.10 said, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Or the NLT puts it this way, for the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow, but worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. So here's two ways of viewing sin, is what Paul's saying. One is worldly grief, and we can see it, it is, worldly grief is horizontal. Its concern is me. How am I affected by this? So if you don't know if you have worldly grief over sin that leads to death, well, the first thing is, do you regret confessing and repenting your sin? That's what he says. It leads to salvation without regret. Do you regret? Or do you justify your sin? Do you try to rationalize your sin? Maybe my sin is really not as bad as others. Maybe it's not as big or as heinous as other sins. It doesn't have the grand consequences of other sins. If, if you're justifying your sin, if you're blaming others for your sin, if you're minimizing your sin, you, my friend, according to Paul, have worldly grief. That is only going to lead to spiritual death. But there's another kind of grief that Paul talks about that we see in, at work in the Ninevites. It's on a vertical plane. It's godly sorrow, godly grief over our sin. It is vertical because it's concerned not with me, but with how I have offended, how you have offended a holy and a righteous God, and how that has affected other people around you. Genuine repentance will determine whether you live your life rejoicing that you have confessed sin or regretting that you have confessed sin to in your life are you rejoicing or do you regret it one leads to life one leads to death jesus took god's punishment on the cross for us so that we could take his life and freedom in him of having a dad in heaven of someone that we can come to and say i messed up I messed up, God. I need your, your healing. I need your help. I need you to walk this next step with me. Jesus has given us that kind of relationship. So what does genuine repentance look like? Well, those are seven traits that we see. The second question, and we, we're, we're not going to spend as much time on this one, but what is the result of genuine repentance? What is the result of genuine repentance? Look with me in verse 10. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. So what is it that God caused him? What did he see that caused him to relent? Well, it wasn't the sackcloth. It wasn't the fasting that God saw. In fact, it was how they had turned. It was the intent. It was the change of their heart that God saw that led them to do all that they were doing. When Nineveh repented, God relented, right? That's what we see here. When Nineveh turned from uh, their sin, God turned from the disaster that he was gonna bring on them. Now, I need to make a couple comments. I don't have time to do it. If you go to Life Group tonight, you'll deal a little bit more in depth with this, but there's a couple comments that we need to deal with as we begin to land this plane dealing with this verse. Uh, if you have a translation that says God repented, um, then you know, that's an old translation. That doesn't mean it's a bad translation. The word relent or repent is the same word, um, but it needs to be translated in a different way. Um, and there, there's a reason why, because the word relent or repent, the, the root meaning of that is to feel sorrow. So obviously, that when we feel sorrow over our sin, we use the word repent. But God doesn't feel sorrow over sin like that because he doesn't have sin. 
So we can't use the word repent there. We use the word relent. So what God is sorrowful over is, are the consequences of our turning away from him, our consequences of the judgment that has to be given. God is sorrowful of seeing that come. Listen to Ezekiel 18. Uh, uh, 32, he says, for I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. So turn and live. God doesn't want to judge anyone, but he has to judge sin. He will judge us if we do not turn to him, but he doesn't want to. He wants mercy to triumph over judgment. But the second part to this is, we shouldn't translate necessarily repent, but more relent, But does that mean, because the text says that God was heading in one direction and he decided not to do it, that God changes his mind? Look, guys, God does not change his mind. Don't ever think that. God does not change his mind. In fact, God is immutable. He is unchangeable. God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God doesn't change his mind, according to James 1.17, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Numbers 23.19, God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. God does not, want, does not change his mind, and you don't want God to change his mind. You don't want God to change. If, you, if, if I say that and you're like, well, I do want God to change his mind, it, it seems, like, no, you don't. You want a God who is faithful in every aspect. Because see, if God could change his mind with this, what's keeping God from 10 billion years from now, all of his you know, family are all in heaven, and one day Jesus stands up off his throne and says, you know what, I changed my mind, I'm done, go away. You don't want a God that changes his mind. You want a God that is faithful. There's security in that kind of salvation. So what does this mean? It seems like God is changing his mind, he's not. And some of you need to pay real close attention to this. Because you may have heard things like this, but you may have, hopefully, uh, you've not, I mean, I hope you've been given an opportunity, if you've been coming here, to turn to Jesus. God doesn't change his mind. But the way in which God issues and pronounces judgment, every judgment that God gives in the Bible and then to us has two possible outcomes. In every judgment, there is always, if you turn to your own way and you refuse to listen to God, there is destruction that is coming. But if you turn to him, there is life. Ezekiel 18, 23, turn to me and live is Jesus' invitation to some of you this morning. Some of you have been trying to do life your own way you're dead set and trying, I can do this, I'm going to be good enough, I'm going to, you know, do whatever, you know, I'm going to clean my act up, whatever it is, you cannot do it. You are turning to your own way and not to God's, and the only end in that is destruction. But God has offered us his son that has taken his, our punishment on the cross and that he is alive today if you will come to him, if you will turn to him for forgiveness and the mercy and the grace that he offers in Jesus. So what is it? How do you do that? Well, you need to admit that you got sin. You need to admit that you don't have it all together. You need to admit that I need a savior and Jesus is that great savior. And then you come to him. You say, Jesus, I need you. I I want you to forgive my sin. I want you to live in me for the rest of my life. I wanna follow you from now on. It's that simple, guys. It's either turn to him and live, or eventually you're going to have to pay for your own sin. But you don't have to. Jesus has done that for you. But maybe, you know, what if you're already saved? You're already following Jesus. Well, I think the, the, the third line of come thou fount is very applicable to us right now. This was written by Robert Robinson. I'll save you the whole uh, history on this song, but... He was a Baptist preacher, 18th century. Um, he, uh, the story goes, he walked away from God and ends up coming back to God um, and, and all that. But here's the third line of his hymn, Come Thou Fount. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness or grace like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. 
prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Does this need to be your prayer today? Without God's grace at work in our life, this is us, prone to wonder, prone to leave, prone to forget what God has done. This is the issue that we need to work on probably more than any as good followers of Jesus is to confess and repent and make that a daily habit to continue to strengthen our relationship with Christ, continue to mold the image of Jesus in us. May we say with him, here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. God loves to give second chances to those who turn to him in faith. Who in here needs a second chance today? A third, a fourth, a tenth, a thirtieth. You know what? Doesn't matter. God is here and he wants to give us that chance in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that in Christ you have provided all the chances that we need to turn to you, God. Because, God, we're not perfect and we won't be perfect on this side of heaven. There's no way that we can pay for what we have done. There's no way that we could keep up the relationship. That's why we need Jesus. That's why we need your mercy and your grace at work. That's why we need to be real and to be transparent with our need for you. So God, I pray that you would help us and move us into that uh, intimate walk with you. That God, we don't want to hide anything from you. That we want to lay our lives open before you. And that God, through confession and repentance, because Jesus is our, our, our intercessor of, uh, in heaven for us right now, God, that God, you use that honesty about who we are and our need of you, God, to, to transform us, to continue to, to remake us into the image of Jesus. And for those in here, God, that don't know that yet, that have not experienced this life change, this salvation that you give to us, God, I pray that you would, you would move in their heart. You would show them your, their sin this morning and that you would show them and convict them of their need for Jesus. And so, God, we love you. We thank you for this morning. And we ask that you would do the work in our hearts and in our minds that only you can do. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, please stand with me. We're going to have a time of uh, response. And if uh, you have never uh, received Jesus to be your Lord and Savior of your life, obviously we want to give you an opportunity to do that. If you need to just use these uh, steps or this front pew as a makeshift altar and pray, uh, you know, rededicate your life, or maybe you've never followed in believer's baptism, or that you have finally been convinced of God that this is the place where you want to see your family uh, continue to grow in Christ's likeness uh, and in church membership, then we want to help you do that. However God is leading, may he lead in the freedom that he has, and may we respond in obedience. Dusty. Oh, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than have
right, you don't have to be seated. We're going to be uh, not be real long. Um, look, uh, you know what this is? This is our uh, Highland Swag Bag. And so if you are our first time guest, we want to uh, give you one of these. Just thank you for coming. Um, I, I have a little tent out front. Um, and uh, I know it's hot. We won't be long out there. But I would love the opportunity to meet you. Thank you for coming in person. And so I also want to... Um, Tell Dusty, thank you again um, for, I always love serving with you, man. Uh, love this guy. And, and, and Mary Ashley uh, and family, thank y'all uh, for being with us today. Um, also, we have life groups starting at 5 o'clock. If you don't know anything about that, we'd love to tell you about that. Those are uh, discipleship-focused small groups. Um, there will be one here at the church, and there's a few others around. Um, raise your hand if you're a home that hosts a life group. All right. Uh, Good. So there's a few people that if you want to know uh, more about it, then you can. Um, and then we also have the September 22nd uh, coming up, uh, the casual Sunday. Looking forward to seeing what God does uh, in us and through us um, and in our neighborhood in the days to come. Uh, are we dismissing with song? Yes, we are. Okay. I don't need you right now then, man. I love you, but I don't need you. <laughs> Jesus does. <laughs> Actually, he does. All right. Thank you all. I'll see you out front. All right, so I think this is the point where we join hands, is that right? I have a note that says we hold hands. <laughs> so let's do that. Let's sing Crucified. Thank you. Crucified.